Hi, I'm Susan Weisbauer, co-author of The Well-Trained Mind. And I'm Susanna Jarrett, editor at The Well-Trained Mind Press. And we're talking about education for all parents and for all children in all sorts of settings. So this is The Well-Trained Mind podcast. And since The Well-Trained Mind is all about classical education, we thought we should talk right up front about what classical education is. I mean, I will say that one of the first reactions I got when we were submitting our manuscript about classical education to publishers was that it was, quote, rigid, grim, and joyless. Uh-oh. That, was, that was the first reaction <laughs> I got. Uh, but Susanna, how about you? When did you first hear about classical education and what were your impressions? Let's see. So I was homeschooled from kindergarten through 12th grade, and my parents read The Well-Trained Mind before they started. I'm so sorry. (laughs) Oh, no, that's great. It was good because they actually implemented a lot of classical education ideas without me even realizing it. But I didn't really know what classical education was. It was just in the homeschool community. I think those same stereotypes applied class uh, rigid and and boring and rote and and very, very strict. Mm -hmm. And I associated it with Latin because my parents played around with using different styles of education throughout our homeschool experience. But when my brothers were younger, they tried to do Latin. And then by the time my mom had seven little kids running around and I was school age, that kind of fell by the wayside. So I associated classical with learning Latin with something that is difficult to do and hard to maintain for our family. So I definitely picked up a lot of those same stereotypes floating around in the homeschool community about classical education. I've since learned that they're wrong. And we're going to talk about that more next time in our next podcast. But I was actually reintroduced to classical education as an adult in the summer of 2020. It was right in the middle of lockdown. And I decided that would be a great time to change careers and become a teacher. And the job that I got was at one of the most notorious middle schools in my district. Ooh, notorious how? It was just notorious in being a difficult place to teach. For example, the teacher turnover rate there was so high that the most senior person in our eighth grade English department was a second year teacher. Um, There was nobody else who had stayed from the last year. Oh, wow. (laughs) And so this second year teacher gathered all of us newbies on Zoom to try to explain what it was like to teach at this school. And one of the things that he told us was that at this school as teachers, we would have homework because all the teachers were so new, the administrators required the teachers every week to break down standards as their homework. So standards are very, very common in the in the public education sphere. Sometimes they're used in private homeschool, but they're basically this very dense list of bullet points that explain to a teacher everything their student should be able to do by the end of the class or the year. And in order to use them, you kind of have to break them down um, because they are so dense. And so the second year teacher explained to us the most efficient way to do your homework and break down these standards is to use the trivium. And he said, does anyone know what the trivium is? And nobody knew except for me, but I was kind of shy, so I didn't say anything. (laughs) And so he started to explain the trivium with this metaphor that I've never forgotten. He said the trivium is a method for learning Mm -hmm. and there are three stages and you have to think about building with Lego. In the first stage, the grammar stage, your students have to get familiar with all the different bricks. And that's the basic building blocks of knowledge, basic facts and vocabulary. And then in the next stage, your students need to learn how those bricks connect. And that's the logic stage. And then once your your students know about the different bricks and they know how they connect, then they can build something new or useful. Then they can build a house or a rocket ship or whatever they want with that knowledge. And so... One of the other teachers in the call said, man, I learned more in the last 30 minutes than my whole four year teaching degree. Uh, And I was skeptical at first, but then I saw this trivium, this process for learning and practice because this teacher would use it in his classroom. We weren't supposed to, but he did. So, for (laughs) example, if we were told we needed to give our eighth graders an essay instead of just giving them the essay, he would first he would pause and he would teach them all the basic vocabulary around the assignment and also around the prompt for the assignment. And then he would teach them how to outline with a different essay prompt entirely, with an essay prompt that was much less abstract and more concrete than the one we were supposed to use. Mm -hmm. And then he would have them write the essay that we were supposed to have them write. And I was interested in what he was doing, but because I'm not, I'm not a natural 
actual rule breaker, I was still doing things the way the administrators told us to do. And despite all of my enthusiasm and my workshopping and my after school helping, his kids were churning out essays that were just way better than my kids. I mean, the the comparison was staggering. And so naturally, I married him. Um, But that's a story (laughs) for another day. I was not expecting that end of the story, Susanna. Yes, the story goes on and on, but we'll stop it there. I became very interested in in classical education from him, my now husband. And now... Okay, this is sort of like Pride and Prejudice meets the well-trained mind. Yes. I love it. You didn't know there was going to be romance. I threw that in at the end. I didn't. I'm very excited. (laughs) So now as an editor at The Press, it's really been a delight to learn more and more about classical education and how have those stereotypes debunked and even get to be part of building curricula that makes it easy to implement for teachers and parents. But yeah. anyway, that's how I came to classical education. But you, Susan, are the expert in classical education. So I'd love <laughs> to hear how you would explain what a classical education is. Well, one of the things that I had definitely noticed, and this goes all the way back to 1999, when The Well-Trained Mind first came out, it was unexpectedly popular. I mm. think my publisher never really expected it. I, I remember one of the great quotes from my editor's then assistant. She said to me, you know, I'm trying to keep an open mind about how well this book will do. That's when we were still in the editing process, because I'm sure there are people like out in the Midwest somewhere who do stuff like this. Oh, my <laughs> I was like, goodness. Oh. Thank you. Um, But, you know, the book came out and it sold much better than anyone had anticipated. It we kind of got to be a staple on homeschooling speaking circuits. And I noticed after a couple of years that a lot of curricula were suddenly labeling themselves classical. Oh, wow. That had never been classical before. That's interesting. Yeah. And I think we have continued to see the word classical used really as a marketing device almost more than anything else by many any curricula and programs that I would not necessarily call classical. So I'm I'm going to sort of go through my take on it with the understanding that this is my take on it. When I talk about classical education, I like to say that it's stupid to argue about what is quote unquote real classical education because none of us are actually doing what the Greeks and Romans did. That mm-hmm. was you know, you learn by rote. If you don't learn your lessons, you get beaten. Your slave carries your tablet home and the girls don't get any education at all. None of us are interested in reproducing those aspects of classical education. So I always like to use the word neoclassical because we're all redeveloping an ancient tradition so that it fits us now. And in terms of modern neoclassical education, what we're really doing is we're not even redeveloping what the Greeks and Romans did. We are redeveloping the ways in which medieval and Renaissance educators redeveloped the classical tradition. So, you know, we're at least two removes out. Right. The, so in, in traditional Greek and Roman education, there were actually two different sets of things. There was the trivium, which was grammar, logic, and rhetoric, which we're going to talk a lot more about. And then there was what was called the quadrivium. So the trivium was the arts of expression. This is how you learn things, analyze them, and talk about them. The quadrivium was the arts of knowledge. And in medieval and Renaissance times, that was arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. You know, now, of course, we could add multiple other fields of study. But what happened in medieval and Renaissance education is that the Greek and Roman tradition got taken over by clergymen. Cathedral schools were the main vehicle of education. And for a clergyman, and these were all like, you know, budding clergymen in these schools, the quadrivium wasn't considered to be all that important. You know, Mm. nobody cared if a clergyman knew music or astronomy. Right. But he had to be able to express himself. He had to be able to read and speak and convince others. So in the medieval and Renaissance schools, the trivium really sort of ascended to the primary position. And that is what has come down to us in the present day as what I would think of as a traditional liberal arts education really focused on the arts of expression. Wow. So what we have is really more medieval than it is ancient, but remake of the remake of ancient doesn't slip off the tongue as nicely as classical education. Classical is a lot snappier. Right. right? <laughs> yes. 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 If we said this is a 500 year old. Re- no, that's not going to work. So we're using classical as shorthand, basically. Mm-hmm. And so let me just lay out what I would see as some of the principles underlying this method of education. It is language intensive. 
It is not solely language centered, but it is language intensive. Remember, we're talking about the arts of expression here. So words are going to be really important. There's this immense emphasis on not just reading, because I think sometimes classical gets identified with books, Hmm. but speaking, conversation, learning through dialogue, using both spoken and written language to process what's going on in your mind and express it to other people. So classical education doesn't, certainly doesn't devalue images, but in terms of actual learning, words get priority. So that would be the first principle. The second principle I would say is that the focus is really on training the mind to learn. So we're gonna talk about grammar, logic, and rhetoric, these three stages of education. And just as your um, now husband Mm -hmm. taught his students, you know, this is a way of taking any field of knowledge, grabbing onto it, figuring out what it's all about, and then expressing your ideas about it. So it's important to recognize that no classical educator would ever say, it doesn't matter what you learn. It just matters that you learn how to think because content does matter. Right. But classical education is very different from something like the core knowledge curriculum, because the focus there is on learn this list of things and you will be educated. Whereas Mm -hmm. the focus in classical education, it really is more on the process. Learn how to think and you will be educated. I tend to think that's a more practical way to approach education because there's so much out there, you know, right there. <laughs> how are you going to make a list of the things? I, I just think that's an essentially flawed right. approach to education. It also seems like it'd be impossible to agree on what would exist on that list from family to family, culture to culture, state to state, time to time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yes. And I mean, we have certainly seen that in the big fights over history standards, right. both in my state, Virginia. We can talk about that on a future podcast. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah. But in many states. You're absolutely Mm -hmm. right. And then finally, I would say classical education, and this, I guess, is where we would sort of get back to the rigid, grim, and joyless part. Classical education does demand um, self-discipline. So there there are many parts of any education that can be delight-centered and student-led and interest-focused, but classical education is never afraid to say, yeah, this part's boring, do it anyway, because it will make things better later on. Mm, yeah. Interesting. So there's no fear in classical education of asking the student to do something that isn't instantly pleasurable or instantly rewarding, because as parents and educators, we know that there's going to be a greater payoff down the road. Right. And that makes me think about in classical education, another thing I've heard in relation to self-discipline is this idea of developing both knowledge and virtue. And the idea of virtue as a goal of education is something I see often in relation to classical education. Would you say that the self-discipline part is connected to that? Yeah. And in fact, self-discipline has a lot in common with the first of what we think of as the four cardinal virtues. So virtue is an abstract term. A virtue is a good thing. In And now we actually will go all the way back to the Greeks because this is from Plato. Mm -hmm. It's from the Republic, book four, Further developed by Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages. So once again, we're looking at a medieval redevelopment of an ancient tradition. Plato lists the what he calls the four cardinal virtues because he says they're the virtues from which all other virtues stem. And we're going to talk about them as we go through grammar, logic, and rhetoric. But just as a preview, they are temperance, prudence, courage, and justice. And, you know, temperance, temperance is essentially it's restraint. And that may sound negative, but the truth is it's a positive virtue. It's the practice of self-control. It's the practice of Mm sound-mindedness. And to be able to do something that isn't fun because you know it's going to be better in the long run is one of the ways in which we develop the first of those cardinal virtues. It's a way in which we develop prudence, temperance, restraint, self-control, sound-mindedness, you know. So the, the, the development of those four cardinal virtues is very much part of the pattern of classical education. Awesome. That makes sense. Yeah. So let's go back to grammar, logic, and rhetoric for a minute and interrupt me at any point as I now feel like I'm in lecture mode. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) Unfolding my thoughts to you. I'm here as a receiver, (laughs) but I will also interrupt. (laughs) Well, yes, please do. Um, So what is really, I think, central to the modern practice of neoclassical education is this three-part method of learning 
grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And what I find so compelling about grammar, logic, and rhetoric is that each stage builds on the one before, and each stage is particularly appropriate to a certain point of development in the student's life. So big overview, grammar is learning the nuts and bolts of something. Logic is figuring out why it works the way it does. And then rhetoric is the exercise of that knowledge, whether that's by, I like to use the illustration of crocheting because I raise sheep and I crochet. I keep learning how to knit. I've learned how to knit like six times and it never sticks, but I learned how to crochet when I was six. So I can crochet. When you crochet, the first thing you do is you learn each stitch and you just Mm -hmm. practice the stitches and that's the grammar stage. And then you learn how to fit those stitches together into a pattern. And that's like the logic Mm -hmm. stage. And then you create something and that's the rhetoric stage. Or you even make up your own pattern. That's an even like more intense exercise of the logic stage. So it's not just that we do grammar stage studies for elementary, logic stage studies for middle school and rhetoric stage studies for high school, although we do. You're learning this pattern that Mm -hmm. helps you learn anything and then exercise that knowledge. Right. And and one thing I did see a lot as a teacher was where that pattern breaks down, students really struggle. If you ask students to write an essay before they know how to write a, a complete sentence or before mm-hmm. they've ever seen how to outline thoughts in an organized way, it is really, really difficult for them. And then, they're, then they think, oh, there's something wrong with me. But really, they just weren't prepared the step-by-step process to get there. There is nothing wrong with them. And that was one of the frustrating things I saw with my students in my class when we tried to skip those stages. Yeah. Well, and writing is, I think, a place where this really comes to the fore Mm -hmm. because so much of, uh, and we'll have to do, we'll have to talk much more about writing in future podcasts, but so much of writing uh, in the classroom is taught in what is called the inspirational model, which is you say to students, here's something that's interesting, write about it. And what you've just done is you've skipped grammar where you not only learn about the subject, but you study how other people have written about the subject. And logic, where you outline, you break down how to develop an idea and what order to present your ideas to, and you go straight to rhetoric. And you just ask the student to put their thoughts down. Some natural writers can do it, but the majority of students, you know, they just get this deer in the headlights look because they don't have the tools to get where you're asking them to go. Mm -hmm. So going back and thinking about the stages. So let's talk about that for a minute. Grammar stage. The grammar stage is when you get the nuts and bolts. You get the basics of everything. In English, you learn actual grammar. In mathematics, you learn arithmetic, you know, which are the actual sums. You get that basic information in and you are not yet asked to analyze it or to talk about why it's important or how it works. You're allowed to simply absorb. And that is what grammar stage children, elementary stage kids are best at, is just absorbing information. They don't really have the maturity or the life experience to be analytical. Don't ask them what they think about it because they don't know. That's rhetoric. You just let them absorb it. They love repetition. Mm -hmm. They love to discover patterns. They love to repeat things over and over and over. And so the grammar stage and, you know, it's roughly grades one through three or one through four is a time to just like fill up their little minds with information and just let them enjoy it because they love it at that age. It's because it's age appropriate. Right. Um, and I always I always say to both parents and teachers, realize that this isn't a restriction. If you've got a kid that's interested, is always saying, but why, you know, wants to do more of the analysis, then you let them do that. It's rather it's a protection against asking kids to do something that's developmentally inappropriate because something I say all the time, they can't do that until the earth goes around the sun one more time. Right. Uh, It's a protection to keep them from getting frustrated rather than a restriction on them. Right. That makes sense. And I think one thing about that stage that goes back to what you said about kids actually like repetition and that Mm -hmm. they're fundamentally different than us adults. You know, if you've ever tried to read a story to a kid until they get tired, you know, they get tired a lot uh, slower than you do of the repetition. And so I think parents can be scared of using repetition or asking kids to memorize things. But 
there's so much joy when a six year old mm -hmm. repeats all the names of the presidents or all the oh, states they love it. or the specs of a new animal they just learned about. There's just this enthusiasm that you can't recreate at later stages. You don't see a middle schooler with that level of excitement just yeah. telling you raw facts. So it's it's it makes sense to exploit it at that stage where they just love it. And it can be a lot of fun. It can be simply adding, throwing a ball, saying five times five and then throwing them a ball before they answer it. They'll do that all day long. Um, yeah. So it doesn't have to be boring. Well, and it's it's good that you bring up the you don't see that same love of I, I was going to say love of learning. And that's actually kind of true. You don't see that same sort of raw joy in mm -hmm. accumulating information in a middle school student. And a lot of parents get very, very frustrated by that. They're like, what did I do wrong? Mm. What happened to my kid that just couldn't wait to get up and learn in the morning? Well, nothing happened to them except, you know, puberty. It's right. It's par it's part of the maturing process where mm -hmm. the kid no longer has as now we're moving from the grammar stage into the logic stage. The kid no longer has this unbridled interest in accumulating every bit of information under the sun because they're developing actually discernment. <laughs> You know, they're realizing that not everything is actually important. They're starting to develop the ability to think critically and abstractly. And that has to happen in order for students to move into the logic stage of learning. And the focus in the logic stage is on that cause and effect. This happened. Don't just tell me the names of all the battles and when they were fought. Let's think about why it happened. What were the mm -hmm. causes? You know, in logic stage, now is the time where you can start asking them to look at why characters in literature act the way they do. You, know, you shouldn't ask an elementary student, why does a character in a book do something? They don't know. They, they don't know what why they do what they do. They don't know why the kid in the book did it. But logic stage is ready to think about that and to reflect on it. So there has to be this transition between the grammar stage and the logic stage, which is essentially middle school, from just the sheer joy of accumulating information to saying, yeah, but why does it matter? Why am I learning this? That's important when a kid says to you, why do I have to do this? They're moving into the logic stage. It's not a rejection of your teaching. It's the development of critical thinking. So you, you better, you know, be sure you can answer it. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And sometimes the answer might be so that you can go to high school and then you can go to college and you can move out of the house one day. There, there's nothing wrong with that answer. But if you really can't think of any reason why you're asking the kid to do something, you know, then you're being pushed to be a little bit more logical yourself. Right. Yeah. And if if I had to think of an equivalent as far as grammar students lighting up when they recall information, middle school kids are, are my people. I was a middle school teacher. I love middle school kids. Um, but I would say the closest equivalent I can think of off the top of my head is that they light up when they can prove that they're right and you're and you're wrong. wrong. <laughs> yes, yes. So that that comes from I think this developing desire and craving for justice and fairness and learning what's right in the world and why and and that can be exploited too. I mean, let a middle schooler look up the errors in an old textbook or look up the logical fallacies in an ad they saw on TV. They love that stuff. Um, it's just interesting to them to see, you know, what's right, what's wrong, and how can I be right? Well, and this has a really practical application too, which is that it used to be that high school students were the most aggressively marketed to of all consumer groups. And that has steadily moved earlier to where middle school students are the target of a lot of marketing. So teaching them to analyze, and mm -hmm. this is key, not uncritically accept everything that they hear, which is part mm -hmm. of the part of the joy of learning for an elementary right. student is they never stop to think about whether or not it's true. They don't have to, but middle right. school student has to develop a filter. And I think a lot of times we interpret that that filter as a loss of interest. Mm -hmm. But it's not. It's just the next stage of development. Right. Or even sass. Like, why oh, do we yes. have to do this, mom? But really that that sassiness, quote, quote, sassiness, that's what they're also turning towards. Like you said, the barrage of information created for them online. They can learn to turn that critical thinking towards that and um, and evaluate it properly rather than just accepting anything like a, a younger kid would. And, it, and it's because of that increasing maturity and sophistication and thinking that the middle grades, the logic stage is when we start to see the right time to develop the next two of the cardinal virtues. So we talked about temperance, which right from the beginning is this might not be fun, but I'm going to do it 
I'm going to work hard at it because I know it's going to it's going to yield results down the road. But the next two of the classical virtues are prudence and courage. And I find these really just so important when you think about middle school students. Prudence is the ability to discern the appropriate course of action for a given situation. And just let that one marinate for a minute. Does a seven-year-old generally pick the appropriate course of action for a given situation? I mean, I would say almost never. Probably not. <laughs> yeah. And, and partly it's because, you know, when you're six or seven, almost right. every situation you encounter is one you've never seen before, right? Yeah. You have to live through a few more years and live through some more situations to have the maturity to begin to think, okay, my brother just punched me. I'm not six. I'm not going to just punch my brother back. I'm going to think about ways in which I have been taught to respond to this situation and try to pick one. Now, mm -hmm. they don't go into fifth grade doing this, right? It's, there's a development that happens here. But you cannot develop, in my opinion, prudence with mm -hmm. a grammar stage child. They're just not equipped for it. But you can begin to teach a middle school student how to pick the appropriate course of action. And then what I think is just an even more, you know, because I've, I've got four kids, so I've been through mm -hmm. middle school four times. I've got a granddaughter who's getting close to middle school age. Courage or fortitude. This is, in the cardinal virtues, the ability to confront fear, uncertainty, intimidation, and master your fear. Again, in middle school is when students need to begin to learn to do this for themselves. For an elementary stage student, we are their fortitude. We are their courage. You know, we tell them that everything is going to be okay. But a middle mm -hmm. school student is, is old enough to know that you can't always protect them. You can't always make things better. And they have to begin to learn to confront their fears themselves. And I just find that such a poignant part of this journey from, from the grammar to the logic stages. Right. All those things that they're dealing with at the same time. I mean, you got to give middle schoolers some slack, those logic students some slack. They're going through a lot. Like you said, transitioning to learning the world. Their, their moms and dads and parents can't always keep them safe from everything. There's hormones going on. There's a lot going on, but they're, they're learning so much and growing so much. Yeah. Well, there, there's an illustration I often use when I do workshops, which is it's not academic, it's family centered. And it's about the transition from grammar to logic stage that if you are six year old, if your grammar stage student comes out at 10 o'clock at night when they should have been asleep and says, I can't go to sleep because I'm afraid a robber is going to break into the house tonight. You actually, if or at least I always did as a parent, you, you actually lie to them. You say, mm -hmm. no, they're not. There's not a robber going to break in the house. Go back to bed. Well, that's actually not completely true. I mean, a robber could break into the house. You don't really have any way of knowing, you know. But if you said to the student what is actually true, which is very unlikely, we live in a really safe neighborhood. I mean, there's always a small chance, mm -hmm. always a small chance, but probably not. You don't say that to them because they would never sleep again, right? Right. So the grammar stage answer is, I am your courage. Everything is fine. Go back to bed. So then the contrast is, you know, your 12-year-old comes down and says, I'm afraid someone's going to break in the house. And you say, no, they're not. And they say, how do you know? <laughs> yeah. Right. Because because they're past the point of believing your assurances, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do to that, that at that point, you can say, here are the statistics. But also you need to tell them what the plan would be if a robber broke into the house. Here's what we would do. You know how to call 911. You would run. You, you, you give them a plan. That's mm -hmm. developing courage in them. It's developing fortitude and a way to face their fears. So then we move to the rhetoric stage. And here we go. I like. Yes. And well, it, it, this is in some ways is the most it's it's when you start to get to do the really fun stuff. Rhetoric stage is, you know, it's essentially we're moving now into the high school years and rhetoric is the art of self-expression. And if you think about the art of self-expression and then you think about a high school student, you can see how much of a high school student's identity is wrapped up in knowing who they are, that they're different from their peers, they're different from their siblings, they're different from their parents. High school students have this immense need to say, here I am. This is what I believe. This is what's important to me. This is who I'm going to become. This is what I am good at. So in classical education, the focus of the rhetoric stage has to be the 
articulation of of knowledge, the articulation of ideas. And there are far too many curricula, even many that call themselves classical, that still rely on a lot of rote learning, short answers, multiple choice, fill in the blank sort of information in the rhetoric years. And that is absolutely not what a rhetoric stage student needs. A rhetoric stage student needs to be able to express how and why they know what they know and they believe what they believe and they do what they do. That has to be the focus. And in the classical curriculum, we do this through the study of history. We do this through the study of literature. We do this through the study of science. But the focus always has to be on saying to the student, what do you think and why? I think that This stage can in some ways be particularly difficult for parents for a couple of reasons. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. The first thing that comes to mind when you talk about high schoolers needing to say, this is me, Mm -hmm. um, your teenager's idea of this is who I am may differ from your idea of who they want to become. And as a young child, you know, uh, an elementary student, for example, their political ideas, as much as they have them, are going to be the same ones you have. They're going to be yours. Religious Mm -hmm. ideas are going to be yours. But at this stage, there's almost an inevitable time where, where kids are going to be thinking, no, what do I believe? And they may end up coming back to what you believe, but it'll be their belief then, or they may tweak it or they may move another direction. But I think that can be difficult for parents to navigate because there's almost this renegotiation of trust between parent and child as the child is coming into their own sense of self. Yes. And I, I mean, you, you don't, I, my youngest child is 22. So I've been through this again, four times. You have been through it as a child, right? You and I both know that as much as we may want to control our children and make them believe what we want them to believe, it doesn't work. It can work in the short term, but in the long term, you don't have control over that child. You're right. High school is a process of letting go slowly, prudently, carefully, Mm -hmm. but there has to be a letting go for the parent. I think a lot of when you see a child being sort of kept in grammar and logic stage learning on into high school, it's because there's this fear of allowing mm. the student to really explore and articulate. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get to this next time when we talk about what classical education isn't. Classical education isn't safe. You know, it is not. And I think that's a popular misapprehension that we'll, we'll, we'll unpack a little bit. Classical education is not there to protect your children from dangerous modern ideas. All the dangerous modern ideas are, are back in the Middle Ages already. You know, they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're there. Classical education is about allowing a child to become an adult. You know, this is one of the things that, that I always say when we talk about classical education is you got to know what your goal is. When you're, when you're educating. And the whole goal of education, you know, what's at the end of that 12 years? Because there are so many approaches out there. There's so many books. There's so many directions you could go. Why choose this one? Well, the goal of classical education is to produce a student who can find information, analyze it, and express their ideas about it. And that means at the end of 12 years, you end up with a student who knows who he or she is and can express that. That's the goal. I just, you know, we'll sort of wrap up here with so much more we could talk about and we will in future podcasts. But let me just wrap up with a couple of quotes from classical educators. Thomas Aquinas, there's a goal here of wisdom. So let me back up for just a minute because I didn't talk about the fourth of the of the cardinal virtues, which is the one that, again, you really develop in high school. And that fourth of the classical virtues is justice fairness, rightness, the ability to act on what you know to be right, the ability to take your beliefs, apply them to the social sphere. You have to have a strong sense of yourself before you are able to act with justice and fairness towards others. And that's, you know, one of the reasons why middle school, because they're still a little bit young to have developed that sense, can be the most socially dysfunctional of all of the stages of education. <laughs> it's because they, they they don't know who they are. They're always, they're still testing it out. And so sometimes they find who they are by being unjust towards others, by being unfair, by not behaving 
with righteousness, by not behaving with wisdom. Well, the goal is that in high school, they develop a sense of themselves so that they can develop wisdom, rightness towards others. Um, And this is what Thomas Aquinas says. He says, wisdom reaches mightily from one end of the earth to the other, and she orders all things well. Her labors are virtues, for she teaches self-control and prudence, justice and courage. Nothing in life is more profitable than these. Um, you know, when he's working off the class, his classical master, Aristotle, who and the way he summed up the goal of classical education is this. It is absurd to hold that a man should be ashamed of an inability to defend himself with his limbs, but not ashamed of an inability to defend himself with speech and reason. For the use of rational speech is more distinctive of a human being than the use of his limbs. Wow. So we're teaching students to be human because right. we are teaching them how to think and how to talk about what they think. And, you know, of course, the Apostle Peter says we should always be able to give an answer for the hope that is in us. So that is the real end goal of this this project of neoclassical education. Wow. Yeah. That's beautiful. Well, thanks for sharing all that with, I feel like I learned a lot about classical education in the last 30 minutes or so. I think we might have gone longer than that. But that's okay. That's okay. So anyway, that's what classical education is. There obviously there are many other aspects. I hope we'll talk in the future. I'd like to really talk about modeling and copying as important in the classical education process and the difference between that and asking for creativity. I'd love to talk about the centrality of world history, but you know, we've we have so many conversations that we can have in the future. But that's what classical education is. And then of course, next time, which is going to be fun, we will talk about what classical education isn't. I am looking forward to that conversation. I know. So that's it for today. And you guys out there, join us for the next conversation. And thanks for listening to The Well-Trained Mind. And please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, we'd love to hear from you all your thoughts on classical education, home education, school education, any kind of education that interests you. You can reach us at podcast at welltrainedmind.com. So feel free to send us an email. We'd love to hear from you. 